flunk, 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 flunk. Okay, flunk. connecting live video now. Here we go. A sec. Okay, looks like we're ready to go live on Facebook. We're going live on Facebook at the moment, and we're just looks like we're just starting up to be live on YouTube. So just bear with us for 10 or 15 seconds, folks, while we get uh, make sure both streams are up and running. Just need a couple of seconds here. Where's our music in the background, Mister? Oh, Mister. <laughs> hey, Mister. That was your cue, Mike. I want to Hey, Mister. Move your head around a bit, Mike, so we make sure that your camera's working. There you are. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> Evening. <clears throat> There. <laughs> That's good. That starts it out. <laughs> Perfect. We be in business. We are in business. Okay. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday night astronomy show. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Hello. back uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada members, Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. Hey, Paul. And we have Mike Powell here from the PFO Observatory in St. John. Welcome, Mike. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, Peter from Toronto, rainy Toronto. Welcome back. Buddy. Hey, hey, Peter. Hey. Hey, the salute yeah, for Peter. Salute. <laughs> the coop salute. The coop salute. I'm not the hell I'm doing that. <laughs> and we have John on from uh, Halifax. Hey, John and Kim. Evening. Um, so anyway, we've got another... Uh, a mixture of topics here to discuss this evening. Uh, first of all, we're going to get started with uh, our usual uh, little look at what's up in space this week. Uh, then Mike's going to present the first uh, topic in our brand new segment we're calling the Gearbox, where we will highlight a particular piece of astronomy equipment uh, for a review of it. And uh, we're hoping that this will lead, help you to make good choices when purchasing your gear in the future, either for yourself or for a loved one, hopefully for yourself as well. Uh, capturing great shots of planets can be difficult too and are usually best done using video then stacking your images. Uh, Paul is going to get us uh, into his mini workshop, uh, continue on with his mini workshop on DSLR photography for beginners by offering a comparison of capturing views of planets with high speed planetary cameras versus using uh, DSLR. And uh, we'll also have our regular segments this evening, uh, what's new in space of course, uh, Rosanna's fun facts and of course your sub photo submissions for the week. And we're hoping to have time maybe at the end of the show to offer what's coming up uh, this week in space. But we'll, we'll see if we have enough time for that later. Uh, so anyway, another pretty full show on the way. So sit back and enjoy. And remember, this is a live broadcast. So if you have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try to answer them here for you. So uh, let's get started, I guess, folks, with a talk about what's new in space this week. Good evening, everybody on Facebook. Could be my internet. Yes, we are on YouTube tonight, Trudy. Uh, well, at least it looks like we're on YouTube. I'm seeing us on YouTube. Trudy was wondering if we we're on YouTube. Yeah, never, never mind. It was me. She said, "Okay, thanks, Trudy." <laughs> Glad it was you this time, and not us. <laughs> All right, let me get to uh, sharing my screen. Present now your entire screen. I want to present the one we're on, don't I? Oh. I'll get that up first of all. Uh, let's bring my slideshow over. Get my window out of the way. Don't I love this technology? Uh, see what this does. How are we doing there? You guys see that? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> well, this is kind of an interesting little story. I just kind of read over this today, so thought I'd bring it up. Oh, did you know that they served iceberg lettuce on that? Sorry. Well, an aurora that lit up the sky over the Titanic might explain why it sank. Glowing auroras shimmered in the skies over the northern Atlantic Ocean on April the 15th, 1912 the night that the RMS Titanic sank. Now new research hints at that the geomagnetic magnetic storm behind the northern lights could have disrupted the ship's navigations and communication systems and hindered rescue efforts, fueling the disaster that killed more than 1,500 passengers. 
Um, Got to get my other window up here. Hang on. Almost there. There we go. And I need this one. Yeah. Um, eyewitnesses described aurora glows in the region as the Titanic went down, with one observer testifying that the northern lights were very strong that night. Auroras from other solar storms, where the sun expels high-speed streams of electrified gas that hurtled toward Earth. As the charged particles and energy collide with Earth's atmosphere, some travel down the magnetic field lines to interact with atmospheric gases, glowing green, red, and purple. These charged particles can also interfere with electrical and magnetic signals, causing surges and oscillations, according to NASA. A solar storm, also called a geomagnetic storm, powerful enough to produce an aurora, may have also affected compasses and wireless communication on the Titanic, and on nearby ships trying to come to her aid. Even a small disruption might have been enough to doom the vessel. The northern lights were highly visible when the Titanic sank. James Bissett, second officer of the RMS Carpathia, the ship that would rescue Titanic survivors, wrote in his blog on or his blog, yeah, on his log, on the <laughs> night of. <laughs> he didn't have blogs back then, did they? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote on his log on the night of April 14, 1912. There was no moon, but the aurora borealis glimmered like moonbeams shooting from the northern horizon. In an entry made five hours later, Bissett noted that he could see, still see the greenish beams of the aurora as the Carpathia neared the Titanic's lifeboats. Survivors also described spotting the northern lights from their lifeboats at around 3 a.m. local time. The glow arched fanwise across the northern sky with faint streamers reaching toward the pole star. At the same time that the solar storm's charged particles were generating a pretty light show, they could have also have been tugging at the Titanic's compass. A deviation of only 0.5 of a degree would have been enough to steer the ship away from safety and place it on its fatal collision course toward an iceberg. Radio signals that night that were also freaky, operators on the ocean liner RMS Baltic reported. Um, the Baltic was one of the ships that responded to the Titanic's uh, distress call. But the RMS Carpathia got there first, according to Armstrong Browning Library. SOS signals sent by the Titanic to nearby ships went unheard and responses to the Titanic were never received. Well, the official report of the Titanic sinking suggested amateur radio enthusiasts had, had caused interference by jamming the airwaves and so prevented the accurate dissemination of emergency signals to other ships in the vicinity. However, at the time, they had uh, incomplete knowledge of the influence that the geomagnetic storms may have on the ionosphere and disruption to communication. It is proposed here that on that the ongoing moderate to strong geomagnetic storm near the aurora had a negative impact upon the receipt of accurate SOS signals by nearby vessels, as well as interference from amateur radio operators. If geomagnetic disruption from a solar storm did take place, it could have affected all aspects of the tragedy, including the navigation errors that caused the iceberg collision and the failed SOS communications that delayed the arrival of rescue ships. Pretty interesting stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Next article, Japan's Hayabusa 2 will be sent to another asteroid. The Japanese spacecraft at Hayabusa 2 is currently making its round-trip return from an asteroid, bringing pieces of the space rock back to Earth. But instead of ending its run with that cosmic delivery, after dropping off its precious parcel, the spacecraft will sw swing back out into space to visit another rocky destination. Now, after Hayabusa 2 re delivers its samples of asteroids Ryugu, to Earth in December, the craft will head off toward a new asteroid target, 1998 KY-26, the Japan Aerospace Agencies said in the statement. The spacecraft should reach a new asteroid in 2031. The Hayabusa 2 reached asteroid Ryugu in 2018 of June and spent over a year studying the space rock. The spacecraft left Ryugu in November of 2019 and its sample return capsule will return pieces of the asteroid to Earth with the December 6th landing in the Australian outback. Hmm. Well, now. <clears throat> and there's only one more story because these ones are kind of long, so this is my third one. <clears throat> and finally, NASA's, <laughs> NASA's new space potty in decades, a, 23, <laughs> a $23 million titanium toilet, better suited for women, is getting a not-so-dry run at the International Space Station before eventually flying to the moon. 
Now, the new Lou was packed inside a cargo ship that successfully blasted off Friday evening at 6.16 p.m. from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility on Wallops Island, Virginia. Station residents will test it out for a few months. If the shakedown <laughs> goes well, <laughs> the toilet will be open for regular business. With SpaceX now launching astronauts to the space station and Boeing less than a year from sending up its first crew, more toilets are needed. The new one will be in its own stall alongside the old one and on the U.S. side of the outpost. The old <laughs> toilets carry, cater more toward men. To better accommodate women, NASA tilted the seat on the new toilet and made it taller. The new shape should help astronauts position themselves better for number two, said Johnson Space Center Melissa McKinley. Quote, cleaning up a mess is a big deal. We don't want any misses or escapes, she said. Just Let's just say everything floats in, in space. <laughs> so going to the bathroom in space may sound simple, but sometimes the simple things be can become more difficult without gravity, said NASA astronaut Mike Hopkins. Like other space toilets, the new one will use air suction as opposed to water and gravity to remove the waste. Now, pee collected by the new toilet will be routed into NASA's recycling system to produce water for drinking and cooking. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> as, as a quote says, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, titanium and other al al alloys were chosen for the new toilet to withstand all the acid in the urine pretreatment. The toilets and seats in the space station's bathroom have such small openings that crew heading to the space station actually have to do target practice as part of their training. <laughs> <laughs> this, this involves sitting on a simulated space toilet with a camera in the bowl and practicing alignment by watching via a screen in front of them where their butt is positioned. Would that be drift alignment? <laughs> I think so. That could be. <laughs> That'd be draft alignment. <laughs> drip al maybe drip alignment. Drip alignment. <laughs> well, NASA is exploring other ways to improve its waste systems for future oh. missions. For example, the agency is re researching how to extract water from solid waste so it can be recycled for crew missions. Oh, joy. <laughs> oh. Water is a precious resource in space, and even though feces are up to 75% water by mass, all of it currently goes to waste. If water could be extracted from astro poop, it could allow other sources of recycled water, such as urine, to be put to use as a building material or fertilizer. NASA will be harvesting, dat harvesting data from the test toilet on the space station, as well as feedback from the crew that will inform design changes to the universal waste management system. And that's what's new in space this week. Well, data sounds good. <laughs> and to boldly go. And you know what? If the guy misses, to badly go where no man is. <laughs> I wonder if you flushed if that causes the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, only the Martians. I saw mind. I saw a comic with that. It had a, uh, an alien sitting on a toilet, and he flushed the toilet. And, his, and there was a guy and a girl standing on the on the on the shoreline, and looked up. Oh, look, a shooting star! <laughs> make a <laughs> wish. Make a wish. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, that's this week. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh, oh somebody's uh, Peter commented. I love Darth Vader tonight. Let's have a look here at Mike. What oh, Mike yes. has set up here in his, <laughs> his background. <laughs> that must have taken some practice to get that one ready. <laughs> the, the gymnastic high school team, eh? Yeah. To go where no one has gone before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh well. Okay, so right after that segment, that one went over well. Yeah. We can only hit a, a, a we can only hit a high point from there, I guess. Eh? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, liar. Wow. I don't know how you follow that. I really don't. <laughs> Why are you going to give you it gotta, a try? You got to pass number two before you get to number one. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, well, let me try sharing this and see what happens. Okay. Uh, we should be coming up here. We are. Me there it is. There, right. And that's all three of us. All from the moon shadow, myself from the PFO, and astronomy by the bay. And we are. Dun, 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 dun. I got to have music for this. Oh, yeah, we got to get music for this. <laughs> <clears throat> and our newest installation, or <laughs> oh. not of a gearbox, or one of those boxes they had up there in space, but our version <laughs> of the gearbox. <laughs> Hang on, Mike, just for a second, if you would hold on for a second. 
we're, we're having a little bit of trouble with uh, Facebook. Just a second. No worries. Not sure what happened to the uh, live feed on Facebook. Looks good from this end. Oh, you are seeing it okay? I see it all right. Do yeah. you see the gearbox uh, picture? I do. Okay, all right. If you're good on Facebook that way, I'm, I'm just not seeing it on my uh, on my distribution, but I do see it going out on OBS. So if you're good, that, then I'm good. Rob Deere says he can't wait till the new toilet goes to Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I think it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Um, while, while Mike's doing that, Paul, are you able to log on to Facebook and just keep an eye on the on the feed? Or uh, I, I can keep an eye on the YouTube. I'm, I'm good on the YouTube one. Uh, just one sec. I'll okay. see if I can. Facebook. 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 YouTuber's working. Okay. So Davida KD says, I can see the gearbox. Thank you, Davida. So just hang on one sec. We're just going to be sure that we do keep an eye on it on our end because uh, on my uh, on my feed out to you, I'm not seeing the picture on my on my live uh, producer page. So we'll just hang on one sec, folks. We're here with you. I see the picture. Yeah, the okay. gearbox is there. Okay. okay, perfect. So if you yep. keep that up, uh, Paul, and when, uh, when Mike's done, I'll get him to flip over to it. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. I can see the comments, no problem. I just can't see the video playing. So, okay, go ahead, Mike. So, so do you want to uh, – oh, sorry, Mike. Were you going to kind of introduce the new segment? Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I was going to say, shall I continue on as though we were normal? <laughs> we're not normal. <laughs> Get that. This, this is the new segment called the Gearbox. So what we're going to be doing with this segment is uh, introducing um, equipment. This is a uh, gear. <laughs> this is a gear. There we go. Piece of gear that, that each of us have, and uh, our quick reviews on on uh, on each piece. So hopefully we'll be able to help you make decisions down the road when you're looking at purchasing your own gear, or more of your own gear. Or you find a whole bunch of it in the picture behind us and say, "I don't want to get into this sport because it costs too much." There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight for uh, our inaugural uh, piece of gear, I'm going to talk to you about a scope that I picked up a few years back. Uh, there was only 30 of them made by Antares of this version. There was a different version that had a, a push-on dew shield. They call this the sliding dew shield version. And there was only 30 of them made, and I was lucky enough to get my hands on one. Uh, someone over in PEI actually had won it as a gift in, a, in some kind of a lottery or draw, and uh, they had no inklings to own a telescope, so they walked into the, the telescope shop over there and, said, listen, you want to buy this? It's brand new. And I just so happened to come across it the next day and said, I'll take it off your hands. And he shipped it to me by bus. So uh, it never come out of the box. So I got it virtually brand new at a really good price from the gentleman in PEI. Anyway, I'll uh, drop this slide and uh, show you what it looks like in real life. Let me get rid of this. Bring this up here and stop sharing this. You might have to pin me or something there, Chris. To yeah. We'll do. I'm going to tilt this camera just a wee bit. And I'm going to spin the chair around. I'll pick up the tiny, this tiny little thing here. Now, again, I don't know if my camera, the words might be backwards again. Ah, <laughs> uh, there, but, but that's okay. Uh, if you can see it, it's the Antares 152.9, which stands for the aperture of uh, 152 millimeter, which is a six inch. And the nine stands for 990 millimeter focal length. So this, uh, it's a six inch acro. Uh, there's not a whole lot of big glass out there nowadays. When I started researching to see what the equivalent to this scope is today, uh, Explore Scientific still sells a 152 doublet acro. And uh, I suppose that'd be the comparison to what this is, because you can't get these anymore. So. Uh, just a quick talk about it. 152 stands for a six inch aperture. So there's lots of glass. This particular tube has six baffles in it to, to help disperse any of the light. It's got a focal length uh, considered an F0.5 for a focal length of 990 millimeters. It has a dual speed Crawford focuser on the back. Back here. Holds up to two inch uh, an inch and a quarter uh, diagonals, nine pieces both. 
The uh, draw tube will go up uh, three inches, which is quite a long travel for a draw tube. The optical tube length itself is 38 inches with the dew shield retracted. And with the dew shield out, and they call this the sliding dew shield version because it just slides out, comes to the end. They're 48 inches long. The total optical tube weight is 19.3 pounds. And then when you add the rings and the dovetail to it, it comes out at about 21 to only one and a half pounds. Now, the neat thing about this sliding dew shield is not only does it slide out, but if you twist it, it locks in place and it will not slide back. It's solid as a rock. And then you untwist it and slide it back. So as your scope moves around at night, the dew shield doesn't slide back and forth on you. It stays in the locked position. Now, the diameter of the tube itself is seven inches uh, for the dew shield and then a six inch diameter of the aluminum tube. And it's a one piece machined aluminum tube. The original Ontario's 152 that had the dew shield that come off, uh, it had basically a plastic lens cell and it had screws that you could collimate the lenses. This one does not. It's all metal. And they said that the machining is so tight that it will never have to be collimated. So that was a, one of the features that I liked about it is you don't have to do anything fancy with it. Just quickly, I'll talk about how they advertise <laughs> the lenses because that's the important part. Now in Acro, they're prone to having chromatic aberration or that green glow around the moon, so so to speak. This one here, it's got uh, two lenses, four surfaces. They're multi-coated with low dispersion uh, coatings. They said it's a well-corrected airspace doublet. It has Fornhofer Elite objective lens, which is research grade, four faces that are coated with magnesium fluoride. Now the magnesium fluoride, what that for is it's a super anti-reflective coating. So it just keeps the light from bouncing back and forth between the lenses. And that was their selling feature for it, was the fact that it had the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, magnesium uh, fluoride coated lenses. So she's a big piece. It gives you lots of, lots of aperture. Got beautiful, beautiful views. Uh, with this, if I can just pull it up, I also purchased uh, from Bader, their moon and sky glow filter, and uh, what's called a fringe killer. See if I can get this started here. Slideshow. Start. And I've got one, two, three, one more. Come on, work with me here. Go to this slide and share this slide. I'll present the entire window and go to this one. So they to come out with this filter. They call it the semi-APO filter. And what it is is they took the batter fringe killer and the batter moon and sky glow filters both. They coated the and, and put the coatings on a single filter and they call it the semi-APO filter. Uh, I have the actual moon and sky glow and the fringe killer. And when I put them on this scope, there is virtually zero chromatic aberration. So now I have a six-inch scope with a 990 millimeter focal length, and there is no discoloration when I look at the, at the stars or the moon. They don't have that green glow about them, and everything is pinpoint and crystal clear. So if you do buy an Acromat with a six-inch objective, uh, which is a heck of a lot cheaper than buying an APO with a six-inch objective, you should look into buying this batter semi-APO filter that goes with it. And there's a price there of the roughly 230 Canadian. So I just wanted to throw that out there as part of the the, the talk because uh, it really makes a difference on this particular lens or this particular scope. And I should stop sharing. Am I back? <laughs> I'm back. Awesome, Mike. All right, there it is again. One more view of the Antares uh, 152.9. Again, the 152 stands for the six inches of aperture and the nine stands for the 900 millimeters of focal length. And I'll tell you, this is a, a nice wide field six inch scope. 
and the views going through this are beautiful. Uh, you know, you just you can't beat aperture, that's for sure. And once you put that uh, filter on there, uh, it makes all the difference in the world, and it's half the price of an APO. So, so, he's, so it's an F6.5, right? It's an F6.5. So it's pretty light efficient, so it's good for dim stuff. <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. And uh, so you've obviously viewed the moon through it. That must be amazing. Oh, it's incredible. Like I said, there's no glow around the moon at all. Yeah. But you know, the detail, because you got six inches of aperture, would be incredible. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Next to putting bunner viewers in, this is probably one of the nicest scopes I looked at the moon through. So, Unbelievable. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, that's my little gearbox talk on uh, this piece of equipment. Awesome. <laughs> the 159 and Terry's. Thanks. Oh, I have a question for you, Mike, if I could. Um, if yep. you were going to use that scope, um, what would be the smallest mount, uh, that most common mounts that are out there that you would use it on if it was dressed up? When I first got this scope, uh, bearing putting a whole lot of equipment on it, just the scope itself, uh, I had it on a Mead LXD 75, which is the equivalent to an EQ5 mount. Mm -hmm. It swung it around with no issues at all. Okay, now, good. Of course, I put it on the, an EQ6 with the C-Gem, and where they have the bigger mount, yeah, it's not much more steady, but it, uh, the LXD 75 or an EQ5 has no problem moving it at all. Yeah, and it's short enough um, physically that it's not too bad for uh, most uh, German equatorial mounts either, right? Absolutely. It, it is considered like a short tube, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got a four inch uh, that's even longer than that <laughs> because it's a 1200 millimeter focal length acro. Yeah. So, you know, it, it falls into the short tube classification when it goes to six inch diameter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The only thing I didn't mention is it did come with this, which is a uh, 50 millimeter right angle illuminated finder with the. Uh, Focusable dual, uh, what do you call it, crosshair lens. That was a nice uh, addition to go with it. I wasn't expecting to get the illuminated finder and all that. I thought it was going to be a straight through. So, but, uh, and it, uh, I've only used it a few times. I had it out at a star party in Nova Scotia and I had it to, uh, I think it was Livingston Lake that one night. Yep. And uh, that's the only time I've, I've really looked through it, besides a couple of nights in the backyard. Where I, you know, just set up and, like you say, I was looking at the moon and just incredible. It's crystal clear and sharp. Wow. So, can you get that today? Like, or did you mention already? Can you get the equivalent? Well, I don't know. In this particular model, uh, because they call it the sliding dew shield, and Terry's only made thirty of them, and then they stopped. I don't yeah. even know if Terry's is still around. Actually, <laughs> prior to this, they made. Uh, the non-sliding dew shield model, and and yeah, they were a big seller uh, they, because uh, the optics they say were better than the Mead six inch and the Celestron six inch. Now the closest I could find to it today is Explore Scientific makes uh, an AR one fifty two acro, and that's the closest thing to this mm -hmm. that, that you can get on the market today. And it's good reviews on that scope too. I mean, Explore Scientific, they you know, they got some really really nice stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You're getting large glass and good quality, you know, and you're not paying an APO price for it. <laughs> so yeah. you, know, you add the better fringe killer to the, and or the AP, a semi APO filter, and I, I honestly got it makes a big, big difference. It's incredible. You swear you're looking through an APO, like it's any chromatic aberration is virtually gone. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, we'll have to have a look through that one. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all excited now. I'm using that 110 double that I got off of you. This is just uh, Big Brother. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I love what it's doing. But like I said, it's it's not considered an ED, but it is low dispersion glass. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, like you said, though, you can add the filters and uh, take care yeah. of any kind of aberrations that you would get. And it does. It makes a world of difference. Uh, you know, you wouldn't think a filter would do that, but they definitely do. Yeah. So. Okay. If they were selling today, like I said, the uh, the Antares 152, uh, brand new today from uh, who's our buddy there in Montreal? Oh, well, near the uh, uh, astronomy, astronomy plus, astronomy, astronomy plus. plus, yeah, 
Uh, he lists it for right around thirteen hundred bucks. Okay. That's you know you're looking in that range today. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's my piece of gear. Thanks. <laughs> great, great uh, first talk on the gearbox. Yeah. Next week we'll talk about something new, something else. If anybody has any questions, throw them out there. We'll try to answer them. Please do. So uh, on Facebook, I'm reading that uh, some people aren't able to comment properly. Um, again, this seems to be our Facebook feed again this week. Our video is, is going out there. I'm watching it on my cell phone easily. Um, but... Uh, Apparently, some aren't able to comment on Facebook. So, I uh, apologize if you can't comment. If you'd like to send me a message uh, later after the show ends, uh, please do. If there's any other comments. But I do see a couple of people here that are, are saying they can comment. So, Yeah, I just good. commented. You did too, Paul. You're good too. So, yeah, so I'm just not seeing the live video going out, but that's okay. If somebody, as long as we're seeing it and people are getting it, that's that's what matters. Always Facebook glitches, eh? And maybe it's with this new, uh, the new Facebook style that's out there now too. I've, uh, I've had the ability to go back to the old version uh, because I have a Facebook page and a, and a personal page, and it allows me to go back. If I go to the, my business page or Facebook uh, Astronomy by the Bay page, it'll let me go back to the old version, um, which seems to be better. But uh, obviously, they, they still get some hookups there. So anyway, doesn't matter. We're live. We're good. So uh, <laughs> right now, Paul, I guess we're going to go to your segment, um, Rosanna's Fun Facts. I guess we'd be next. Yeah. So just that give me a good. second to cue all that up. Still don't like Paul's hat. Okay. Rob is commenting. There we go. <laughs> he says he still doesn't like your hat. So, Well, I still do. <laughs> and that's why I wear it, he says. And in fact, I like my mug. <laughs> and I've got some gloves upstairs in my new coat. So. Boxing gloves. Boxing gloves. Oh, and. Okay. We'll on. give Paul the salute. Paul gets a salute. <laughs> and then oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he needs um, some stickers for scopes. So the only thing I can guess is Rob is either a Boston or a Toronto fan because they're the only ones that mention anything. It doesn't matter. What so do you either say? way, we're all on the golf course. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we were talking about space toilets, and it looks like a toilet seat, you're right in the game. <laughs> 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 but I've got one. <laughs> no matter where I go, I'm good. <laughs> oh, I wonder if we could flush. I wonder if we could flush Paul's hat down the new space toilet. Look at that. <laughs> somebody, somebody with the same same thought, Mike. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm feeling a little flush. <laughs> yeah. uh, All right. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing going here. Trudy says, "Awesome hat, Paul." So there you go. Thank you, Trudy. Okay, I'm gonna try to. What a, suck, to do my what a suck up. She's a suck up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what happens when I press this button. Uh oh, there goes the show. We're offline. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is Rosanna's Fun Fact. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome back, Rosanna, this week. And thank you for another uh, rendition of Rosanna's Fun Facts for this week. And this week, Rosanna sends us something that is very timely. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's all about new discoveries and uh, discovering potential life in other places. And um, so let's bring up the first slide, if I can. I'm any good at this? Oh, wrong one. <laughs> there we go. So for those people who are out viewing the sky, uh, especially within the next uh, week, week pass and the next week coming up, Mars is going to be at opposition. It's going to be at its brightest. And this specific thing that you're looking at on Mars is the South Polar Ice Cap. So, so this has been a pretty exciting couple of weeks with the discovery of the possible presence of the molecule phosphine or phosphine on Venus, suggesting some type of life form may exist. And then just published in September 28th in the Nature Astronomy, uh, that the possibility of buried, buried liquid lies on Mars, which could mean microscopic life exists. Now, let me just um, queue up so I can see my other tang. So Earth's 
Oh, there we go, sorry. So the existence of water on Mars, one of the more hotly debated matters about our cold red neighbor is looking increasingly likely. New research in the journal uh, Nature Astronomy indicates that there really is a buried reservoir of super salty water near the South Pole. Scientists suggest that such a lake would significantly improve the likelihood that Mars just might harbor, harbor microscopic life of its own. Some scientists remain unconvinced that what has, se has been seen is liquid water, but the latest study adds weight to uh, a tentative 2018 finding from radar maps of the planet's crust made by the Mars Express uh, Robot Orbiter. The research suggests that the underground lake of liquid water had pooled beneath frozen layers of sediment near the South Pole, akin to the uh, subglacier lakes detected beneath the Antarctic and the Greenland ice shields on Earth. Earth's subglacial lakes are teeming with bacterial life and similar life might survive in liquid reservoir reservoirs on Mars. And that, that's, this is uh, what the scientists have speculated. So, just see which one I'm on here because I can never tell. Paul, um, yes, yeah. we, we've just seen the one slide so far. Yeah, that's the only one okay. I'm on. All right, perfect. Uh, but I'm trying to find it. There it is. Okay, so let's move to the next one. There we go. Okay, so the next slide, what you're seeing there is. Um, Last year, a noble gas, you know, the noble gases that are basically partly are party poopers, refusing to combine with any other molecules. In fact, no one on Earth has ever seen any naturally occurring noble gas molecules. Well, astronomers discovered the noble gas, uh, argo I can never say that word, argonium naturally occurring in the gases in the Crab Nebula. And this is the first discovery of a naturally occurring noble gas in space. Now the crab, the crab nebula, if nobody knows uh, that one, it's, um, <clears throat> it's one of the uh, Messier objects and um, it's located in the constellation Taurus. So the crab nebula, the, one, the picture that you're seeing there, is the debris left over from a massive star explosion that lit the skies above Earth in 1054. So that's been a long, long time that that's been up there. So that's that image. And there's another one to follow, but I think I'm gonna save that one for next week because there's more of this that's coming up. So um, so basically what this all rounds out to is that uh, three exciting discoveries which I've shown you two tonight. And, um, and the next week we'll talk about uh, the discoveries that they're seeing on uh, Venus as well. So there's some pretty cool things and that's a picture of Venus there, but I'll show you that one next week. So for this week, this was... Rosanna's Fun Facts. Yay. Thank you so much, Rosanna. What are awesome fun facts. And they're getting better every time I every time you turn around. It's just wonderful. We're having quite a discussion about noble gases tonight, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you think? Well, it was, it was timely. Um, stop presenting. There we go. Can I do that? There you go. There, I'm back. You do that you do that segment so much better than I can. Like, you know, that music that you bring in and back. How do yeah. you do that? You're, you're professional at it. <laughs> no, no, not or at I all. Was just, I, I was just have, screwing up. I have it in my dummy area on my computer. Ah. It says, put your dummy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your dummy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Sorry. Appreciate that. And thank you, Rosanna, for another great segment. Absolutely. Um, maybe what we'll do now is we'll move into photo submissions as Paul gets ready for his next talk on uh, DSLR photography. Astrophotography. Okay. More about the planets. Let's um, give me a sec here. We'll get to our photo submissions for the week. So I guess I'll try uh, sharing. All right, and. Let's bring up our photos for the week. So I got a few on the uh, on the Astronomy by the Bay uh, YouTube channel page or the, the link that I send out, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. 
but most of them came in through um, most of them came in through Facebook. So let's uh, take a look at what we got here anyway. <clears throat> Here's a nice shot from Trudy. Well, nice shot, Trudy. Oh wow! Uh, the Fundy Trail, Long Long Beach. Beautiful, gorgeous shot. Very nice. And October the first. A nice moon. Oh, look at that. By Split Rock. That's one of the most beautiful places on the Fundy, Fundy Coast, eh? It is, eh? And she's got shots that had the moon right in here, I know, before as well. So you really yeah. have to really have to look ahead at, uh, to find out when you can get the moon right in that location at Moonrise. But it's a great shot. Absolutely. It is one of the great spots to, to take shots for sure. Here's a shot of the Big Dipper. Big Dipper. Through the grass. Through the nice. Grass. Yeah. That, was, that must be yeah. really low. He must not have mowed the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Might be that. You're right. <laughs> uh, Charlene Smith sent us in these ones. Uh, this is uh, she's here. A few shots of the Harvest Moon from last night. So it was the other night, of course. Um, this is. Uh, she's. It was partially cloudy, so these are the best ones I photographed. Of course, you got uh, Ryan there. And there's the moon. Beautiful. Nice shot there. Nice. Clouds, yeah. Really nice. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. I like oh, that. I'm sorry. You know something? I, I'm going to go back there for a second because those two shots there were from Deanna King. October the 3rd, uh, she says, at 5.22 a.m. in Keswick. So sorry, Deanna. Got that on there, though. That's her Orion and her moon with uh, Mars, I assume. Mars. Yep. Now yep. I'll go back to Charlene. Here we are. Yeah, here are a few shots of the harvest moon. I was wondering, that's not the harvest moon. Here are a few shots of the harvest moon from last night. Uh, partially cloudy, so these are the best ones I photographed, she says. So a few nice shots there. Yeah, it's really nice. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Look at the colors. Look at Beautiful the colors. Color. Yeah, amazing. You just love it when um, when the moon is starting to show that um, solar ring around it, and that's basically the colors that you get. Mm. She really captured them well. She did. Uh, Carol Bean sent this one in Harvest Moon Rising over St. Stephen. Nice. Very nice. Nice capture. Nice to always have some trees or something in the in the shot along with it. But nice thing too is where it's so low on the horizon, it's got that orange mm. color to it, eh? Yeah. Gotta love the moon. You do. Uh, Denise sent this one in from Baldoon, October the 1st, uh, Harvest Moon as well. Nice. Great shot. <clears throat> And Stefan Picard sent this one, Mars uh, by the Trees. Yep. It oh, is yes. Neat. We've had Mars and the Moon uh, running through a few conjunctions over the last couple of months. I guess we'll probably have another chance coming up in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got this one from Kim Warren, Moon and Mars again. Yes. Great, great opportunity right. to get the two of them together in your eyepiece for sure, in your field of view. Uh, Karim Jaffer sent this one in from... Montreal inundated with clouds, but Mars and the moon both shine through at times. And they do. Yeah, the show. They're so there's bright. That, uh, yeah, there's that rain that we talk about. Yeah. Beautiful. They're so they're so bright that they shine through just about anything. Uh, Eric Flack captured this one. He said through uh, his 15 by 70 binos in Smithers, BC. Oh, oh nice. Not bad eh? for binos. So did he, I wonder if he used a, a clip like a, one of our, you know, those. Um, and next by his piece, or did you just yeah. stick his phone to it? Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but it does look like, yeah, it's probably <laughs> well Yeah, not bad. Oh, yeah. That's so cool, the way the moon's not overexposed and Mars is still bright. Yeah. 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 Well done. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe because the binos had something to do with that, or you think? That could be. Yeah. The fact that they're gathering more light. Oh, I wonder who took this one. Oh, here. See, I go Who's by and grab, grab these guys' shots every once in a while because they don't like to post themselves. So, um, Wait, tell, Mike. tell us about that one, Mike. Yeah, tell us about that one. Mike. That was a test shot with that uh, 110 millimeter uh, Orion scope that I'm borrowed from you there to check out. And uh, the moon just saw the other clouds went away, and I had finally had a chance to throw it up on, on the moon. and I got, I think uh, that was maybe 20 shots stacked and then uh, no real major processing behind it. And I was just so impressed with the clarity yeah. and the detail that come out. And uh, 
yeah, I got a big smile on my face and rubbed the hands together and went, oh, <laughs> I'm heading down the right road now. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the, at the crater that's on top. And uh, no, what, yeah, that one. This one. And I'm looking at just the craters on the very edge in that same area. Yeah. And it's amazing how crisp they are. Yeah. They're just like super sharp. Yeah, uh, I, I was real, real impressed with the shot. Wow. I gotta remember when I after I took that I cropped it of course because uh, with the two nine four camera mm -hmm. and uh, it's a what f uh, seven fifty millimeter focal length uh, it was really nice you could still get the full moon in there yeah and, uh, from that perspective I think I can get the whole of the Pallades in if I rotate the camera so to speak yeah so I'm real pleased with uh, the performance of that scope yeah it's uh, wow it's just a, it's just a, it's just nice to see. Um, and what we'll talk about a little later in the segment is when you're putting these pictures all together, how much better they actually look when you start stacking them up. Yeah. In this I mean, case, I have a lot to do with it, but these were individual snapshots through the camera rather than taking a, a, a video. Yeah. Like, you know, that, that quick snapshot button at the top of the sharp yep. cap. Yeah. Yep. Uh, like six of those and stack that. So that was, um, yeah, I was real pleased. And the performance of that scope is incredible. That's a nice yeah. scope. But just it's just nice and crisp. But just so you, yeah. every once in a while, you just look at something and say, "Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. normal." Yeah. Uh, this is another one of yours, Mike. I guess I just kind of snap from your sight. So I, I, do, a little, I do Facebook <laughs> snooping, eh? So yeah. <laughs> Again, I uh, turned it around and, and threw it up on that, and uh, I was impressed. You know, all the stars were pinpoint. Uh, that's blown up quite close, actually, uh, for that scope, but. Uh, I'm real impressed with the performance of that scope. It's doing yeah. everything I wanted to do. So. <laughs> yeah, you may not be the owner much longer, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a really, really good doublet. And I, and the, the point, I guess, behind that is when you go looking for a telescope, um, you don't have to necessarily spend a ton of money on a triplet. You get a good doublet, and you can see the results here, what you're getting right. Now, on that as well, uh, I had the, uh, the better fringe killer and the – uh, moon and sky glow filter, which equalize and make that uh, better uh, semi APO filter. That's mm -hmm. on this system. So, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Now, for you people out there, be careful. Paul is a sneaky salesman who said, just try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So say, we own it. So, <laughs> yeah. He's good at that. He is. <laughs> But no, I'm I'm real impressed. That's a nice scope. It's it's performing and doing everything uh, really really well for what I want. Here's a capture somebody took. Oh my goodness, what's that? Yeah, I don't know. Mar a, oh, in some, there. some information on that one, Paul. Well, um, it's not a great shot, but it's a shot. And um, um, I was out last night in the observatory, and I decided to take my refractor out and put in the big Smith Cassegrain. Because Mars, uh, right now, if you're if you want to image a planet, uh, Mars is in the perfect height in the sky. It's over 50 degrees up there uh, at its highest point. Um, you can get you know lots of time on it, um, and it's as close as it's been in a long time, Chris. I think you you got the the data on that, mm -hmm. but it's going to be in opposition on the sixth. On the it's, it's uh, actually right at our closest approach to it on the sixth. And yeah, then, and opposition. Uh, opposition a week later. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if you're going to go out and do it now, this one here, I didn't even have time to focus on it. I spent hours switching over to this other telescope, finally got things up and running, and I just got it on Mars, and I'm starting to get it in focus. And the clouds came, and I said, you know what? I'm waiting for a sucker hole. I'm getting something. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. Yeah. Okay. You never but if you look up. at the top, you can see that uh, that uh, the polar cap up yeah. here yeah. on the top. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, lots of surface detail, which is only going to get better. Um, so, again, if you are wanting to shoot a planet and you've got, you're going to need a big scope, uh, this is the time to get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are all well placed right now for, for targets, for sure. And Venus, of course, too, in the morning sky. So, yeah, yeah. We've got some great targets yeah. out there right now. And we're all on the same side of the sun. That's the, that's the idea right now. So, everything is up in our mm -hmm. evening sky and, and right through the morning. So, great shot. Thanks. And uh, go back out here. What else we got? Oh, yeah. Well, that one there, I guess, too. That's, well, that's, that's, another, that's another astro photo, so I had to throw it in there. Well, it is astro photo. Yeah. And um, that one there, 
Uh, I was out Saturday morning at uh, 6.30 on the on the Kenby Cases River. And the moon, of course, is up at this uh, right now. When it's full, it stays up and you get a little bit of day moon with it when it sets. So the sun was just coming up on the other side. The moon was just going down and we're floating down the river in a boat. And and basically I'm looking for birds and sunsets, sunrises. But then I flipped around and said, oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> so of course they had to clickety click, click, click. And, <laughs> <laughs> if you look down the bottom, the moon looks like it's it's crescent, but it's yeah, actually yeah. the way ripples in the water is actually three reflections that make it look like it's a crescent. So it's awesome. kind of neat. <laughs> Great nice leaves are changing color too. Yeah. Kind of brings you to your eye though, knowing the cold weather's coming. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind the fall colors, eh? Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> look at the moon. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody yeah. Like, oh, the lovely moon's, fall color. The moon's oh, always yeah. there. Doesn't matter about the season. We always get the moon. <laughs> and finally, get this one from Tim Libby. And uh, <laughs> explanation on this one. Tim says, uh, you know, when you're addicted to astronomy picks and it's a cloudy night out, you decide to set up something better. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> you got to take a picture of something. So he's, got, awesome. so he's got Titan there, Saturn's moon. He's got Milky Way. He's got Mars. He's got uh, a couple of moon pies. Meter, meter down there. A couple of moon pies. He said it was a full moon, so that's why he had to uh, pull them together. Oh, first quarter. <laughs> yeah, first quarter. <laughs> Good imagination, Tim. Not bad at awesome. all. Oh, that's fantastic. <clears throat> and of course, if you want to send in uh, any of your photos, we're we're happy to get them and show them up on on uh, this uh, program for sure. We love getting your photos in, and uh, we won't critique them. <laughs> we just like getting them. So send them in, please, to uh, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. Now, that address is going to change uh, within about a week or so as I get my, my website up and running. Uh, so we'll be sending them over there eventually. But for now, uh, if you could send them in here, we'd love to get them. I also try to pick uh, photos off of Facebook. So if you do send them out on Facebook World, and I happen to you send them out as a, as a visitor post, I do have to capture some of them, too. So if some people are shy and don't want to send them to this address, I'll get them off of Facebook. You'll be, you'll be focused on one way or the other. <laughs> well, we just love getting your shots. So thanks very much, folks. Appreciate all of them. And let's get out of these. I'll get out this way, I guess. There we go. Stop presenting. Oh, back to us again. Hey, we're all back. That was, that was picture perfect. That was picture perfect. <laughs> Enjoyable. I always love those, folks. I always love that segment. Well, I always love all the segments, but whatever. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, Paul, you're up next. Yes. Oh, yeah. A little bit of talk about capturing planets. Okay. All right. So Need before I get into um, full screen, I just want to explain a little bit about what we're going to see here. I'm going to make this one kind of a short one because uh, it's it's too in depth to get into in big detail. So um, the point I'm going to make with tonight's little short uh, presentation is I just want to show you um, the difference between choosing the right camera and telescope for the for the, ta the target that you're choosing. So if you're going to be going after the moon, um, you know um, that's a it's a big, bright, beautiful thing, and it's certainly the best thing if you're going to start taking pictures. That's the best thing to start on because you can practice your focus. It's up you know 20 some times in a run of a month, so you get all kinds of different phases with it. So your picture taking can get um, uh, very, very um, uh, flexible in terms of being able to adjust um, ISOs and all that kind of stuff on your camera. Because when you go into a very thin crescent moon, it's different camera settings than when you go into a full moon we know, and that kind of stuff. So, so the moon is probably one of the best things that you can use uh, to work on. Once you've already worked on the moon with your DSLR and you're pretty comfortable with that, and maybe you've shot some really cool stuff with a nice you know, lens that you have at home. And then you've graduated going into a telescope with your DSLR. You can still take some fantastic moon shots. Mike just showed you that uh, by taking some stills, putting them together. And in fact, to be honest with you, when I shoot the moon, that's usually what I do now because I'm a lazy astrophotographer. And, uh, but the results are fantastic. So I can, you, know, you can certainly still do that. Um, but there is another way that you can take uh, photographs of um, the moon and the planets. And that is through the use of video, which may seem kind of funny if you're thinking, well, all these pictures they see, they're only still pictures. What do you mean video? Well, 
you take it in the form of video where you're taking, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures very, very quickly. But when you're all done, all you're going to do is just the same things we've been talking about all along. You're just going to simply take all those things and you're just going to stack them all together into one image. But the more that you have, then the more um, uh, clarity you're going to get from your image and more important or, or, or as importantly, you're going to get a lot less noise in your picture. So the importance of that to get those high signal to noise ratios is when you're actually have it on your computer and Photoshop or whatever manipulation software you're using to finalize your picture, you've got so much better a signal to work with. So when you start to crank up the color a little bit, you've got all kinds of saturation in there without it going bad on you. Or if you want to go for those shadier areas, because there's some dark areas and you want to bring up more detail in, uh, uh, in the black areas and make them more shady so that you can see those fine details in the dark areas. You've got that dynamic range without all that noise in there. So that's why it's important to take um, you know, as many as you can uh, with whatever setup that you're using and stack them up because you will get better results uh, in the long run and they are easier to process. So I'm going to switch over to a presentation screen and I'm just going to briefly run through something here. Um, so I'm going to do this entire screen and hopefully this will work. We'll see. And am I sharing there yet? Yes. Just waiting to see it on Facebook here. So what, what do you see? Do you see planetary lunar photography? No, I just I'm, I got you pinned right now. So hang on. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I'm going to pin that presentation. Now you're up. Am I up? Yep. <laughs> Okay, so this is just a, what I'm going to show you here is just a, um, uh, a little section that I cut out of a presentation I did on astrophotography. And uh, uh, in this presentation, I was just covering just the little bits of uh, deep sky and planetary and solar and stuff. So this is the actual the planetary lunar um, part of that uh, discussion. So, um, so let's get into it. Maybe. There we go. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is the kind of camera that you're using. Um, when I say take videos, you can take videos with a DSLR if you want to. You can take videos with a webcam if you want to. You can take videos with your cell phone. And you can take videos with a high frame rate um, planetary camera, which is really a fancy webcam. Um, so you can do all of those things with uh, with those um, those tools, but there are things that you need to know um, depending on the target that you want to shoot. Now, if we're going to be shooting the moon, you can shoot the moon with uh, a DSLR uh, in movie mode, and you can do that. But what's going to happen is you're going to really tax and uh, tax your uh, memory because if you're taking you know 300 shots or 500 shots on a DSLR, you want to have a really, you know, a, a big memory card with nothing on it because you're going to fill it up really quickly. Um, you, so you can do that and you can, and then you're going to have to figure out how the, the, the format that you're recording because with, with a, a DSLR uh, in the Canon brand, uh, they, uh, your raw format is called CR2. Um, if you want to shoot JPEG, you can do that as well, but you can shoot large JPEGs and you can shoot not so large JPEGs, you know, a lot less smaller resolution. So, but the whole idea here is you want to get as high as resolution as you can, because that's the whole point of getting a nice clear moon image is having as much resolution as possible. So this can be done with the DSLR. Um, but again, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a little more taxing and there's a few more things you have to go through. And, um, and you know, your camera's a bit, bit bulkier and bigger. You know, there's only so many batteries with a can you can put in the camera and so on. So there are some uh, limitations to using a, a DSLR video-wise for this. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, here's where it gets important to know. And if you're not a technical person, don't worry, you don't have to be. The only thing you have to know is how big is my chip? How big is my sensor? Because if you look at what you, what you see on the screen there, you have... Um, the big pink area is what they call the 35 millimeter sensor. So that's the biggest sensor you're going to get. So when you get a full frame camera, when you hear people say that word full frame, they're using what they call the 35 millimeter uh, format uh, size chip. 
when you use most cameras that most people have out there, like Mike and I have for, we use for astrophotography, are APS-C size chips. So they're smaller. So that would be like either the blue or the yellow one that you see there on that screen. So you can see they're considerably smaller, but they're still a good size chip. And using the, the uh, telescope that Mike talked about tonight with an APS-C size chip, you can get the full disc in your on your camera without using a Barlow. If you use a Barlow, you're gonna have to do a mosaic and take a couple of pictures, put them together. So you can do that uh, with that size chip. But if you go to a high frame rate camera or a, a planetary uh, camera, the chips are considerably smaller, very much like that very less small little block in the corner, way down there and sometimes even smaller. And that's how small the chips are in those. So you're not gonna get with Mike's telescope the full moon in that chip. But what you are going to get is a fantastic view of a crater or a rill or uh, any kind of ejecta that you're going to look at on the moon. You're going to have, because you're going to be so close up, you're going to have those details that are so, so important to get if you really want to get into moon lunar uh, photography. The other side of, of that that I really like is if you decide you wanted to um, uh, study the moon and actually look at the different features, rather than just looking at, oh, there's a the moon, isn't it pretty? Love the moon. Um, <clears throat> here, excuse me, uh, you can um, actually start taking those craters apart. So you can actually say, look at Copernicus, get right in Copernicus and look at those mountain ranges right inside Copernicus. Look at those uh, mountain edges and uh, the terraced walls. You can see all of those details when you're using a camera chip of that size, because what's going to happen is your telescope's only going to give you a certain portion of the moon, and that's when you can get in here. Here's the beauty. When you go ahead and blow that up, like Mike showed you a picture of, I think it was uh, M27 earlier, where he did a crop, you're going to crop this. You're not just going to leave it at native. You're going to actually blow it up, but you want to blow it up to the point where it starts to lose its resolution, where it starts to pixelize. So if you're starting at that size, you don't have to go very much at all. And you're still going to have a really clean picture of something that you can actually um, see some detail with. Um, so that's the beauty of using a planetary camera with a small chip. And so that's why uh, when you're looking at these things, you got to understand um, scale is very important. More important when you're shooting Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn, because they are considerably smaller than the moon is. And, and I'm going to show you something about that. So there's the chips we talked about there. So on the right-hand side uh, is a APS-C size chip. And then there's two planetary cameras. And look how small those sensors are compared to this great big sensor over here. Well, you would think to yourself, well, I want the big sensor because I want as much picture. Yes, you do, absolutely, if you're shooting full moon or if you're shooting the moon itself. Um, then you, you would want that if you want to get full disk in there. But if you want detail, well, then you're going to want to use these little chips for the reasons we just discussed. And if you're shooting Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn, they are considerably smaller than the moon is. So because of that, if you try to take Jupiter and put it in a chip like this, let me just show you, I think, on my next slide. <clears throat> so if you can see my mouse moving on the screen, if you look down at the bottom, that little dot down there, that's Jupiter. But look at the moon. Look how much larger it is. This is on an APS-C size sensor, by the way. So if I go ahead and take the shot of the moon like this, I can blow that up considerably and still keep my resolution because I've got more pixels that are giving me a picture. I've got higher resolution picture on that moon. As soon as I try to blow up that little tiny guy way down there, Jupiter, it's just going to look like a square, a whole bunch of squares. You're going to lose all your resolution because it's just too small. Okay, so the reason you don't want to use a big chip on the tiny planets is because this is what you're going to end up with, and you're not going to get any kind of picture that will have any resolution. Here's Jupiter again with the same size, um, with a, or sorry, with a small sensor, a small sensor with a high frame rate. So now you can see Jupiter, which was about the same size as what the moon was on the previous picture. If I can show the previous picture. No, I'm gonna let me do that. You did it before. 
I can't show the previous picture. Oh, well, never mind. Um, but anyway, that's about the same size. The Jupiter is now about the same size as what that moon was on that previous slide. So, um, so now you've got something that you can work with. So now you can see some detail on Jupiter. You can see the bands. If you look here, you can see the great red spot. There's all kinds of detailed information on that. That's just a black and white image. And it looks, oh, there we go. Here's Jupiter through that very tiny little chip through a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which is, you know, the typical eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain with a 2000 millimeter focal length. You put on what they call a two times Barlow, which is like a magnifier. You stick that in the end and you stick your camera in that. Now you've got 4,000 um, millimeter focal length, which is what you need to get resolution. Resolution equals detail. And if you look at that um, picture of Jupiter there, you can see uh, the nice red spot uh, the, that's on there. You can see festoons. You can see the, the, the cloud bands. You can see all kinds of detail on that image of Jupiter, which I could never ever even come close to getting if I tried to shoot that with, um, with the DSLR, with, the, with what we're talking about on a smaller telescope. So the telescope is important because you, you need the focal length to get you in close. The chip size is important because it needs to be small so that little dot fills up more of that chip so that when you actually look at the photograph, you can actually get some detail and some information. I had, there's a high magnification, magnification telescope. This, by the way, was a video, but it never came out. So there's Saturn with the same kind of uh, situation, taken with an 8-inch SCT with a two, two times Barlow and a small sensor. And then that's when you see those pictures like this, like Damien Peach is probably the most world famous photographer for planetary imaging. And he uses a 14-inch Smith cassegrain telescope, plus he's got the skies. So <laughs> he can do that. But he's got a 14-inch Smith cassegrain that he uses. He doesn't shoot like what I'm showing you is just one shot color. Uh, camera. What he uses is a monochrome camera with the various filters, but again, small chip size and uh, the same uh, scenario we're talking about. Steady seeing is an important thing. Um, steady seeing simply means that when you're looking at your target, when you're looking at something that's up in the sky, if you've got a lot of turbulence in the, uh, in the, in the sky, or if your targets are extremely low in the horizon, you're not gonna get real sharp, crisp, clear pictures because you have too much a turbulence and atmosphere to go through. You're gonna want your uh, planets or um, moon to be as high in the sky as possible. The higher in the sky it is, the less atmosphere you're gonna go through and the more detail, more clarity that you're gonna get. And so when you're actually going out to shoot um, the moon or the planets, you really gotta put a little thought into it because there is a point on what they call the ecliptic, which is that line that imaginary line, and you see it every day when you get up and you look at where the sun comes up in the east, it goes up into the sky and at noontime, say right around December 21st, which is uh, the switch between summer and um, uh, or win uh, fall and winter, um, it's pretty close to being center in the, in the sky. And then it falls to the west. So the moon does the same thing, rises in the east, gets as high as it possibly can on its ecliptic, and falls in the west. The planets do the same thing. So they all follow that ecliptic pattern. So all you have to understand is, okay, when is it gonna be as close as it's gonna be to that true south sky? Because if you know that, that's the highest point it's gonna be on that ecliptic. And uh, then you plan your shoot around that. Then you're gonna get your best skies. Um, you're gonna get your best opportunity, regardless of what the seeing is uh, at that height, because it's gonna be your best vantage point. So that's a little bit of the planning. I won't, I won't get into that, I won't belabor that. Um, uh, this is just a bunch of blur, blah, blah, blah. We won't even get into this stuff, and then that's in the sun. That's what I want to show you on a slideshow. I did want to take a time and show you one other thing, um, if I can find it. Uh, I'm gonna hide that, and bear with me, because I've got a million screens open. I'm jumping for one. That's not it. <laughs> Where'd it go? It's always, oh, I know what I did with it. Sorry, sorry. Bear with me. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, I put it in my planet Terry folder. Here we go. So I'm going to show you a video of, I took last night of Jupiter. 
And look at that. And what you're seeing is a live video. That's me capturing a 30 second capture of Jupiter. Jupiter is not in a good position now because it's only going to get about maybe 23 degrees above the horizon. And last night the scene wasn't all that great anyway. So to get Jupiter and Saturn, you're going to get something like this. And there's not a lot of detail in there. Now let me show you um, another one that I took a while ago under good seeing conditions. There's Jupiter there. Now look at the difference. So you can see, I can see the belts. I can see that this is actually um, shot in, this is, I was shooting an RGB with a mono camera. So that's actually the blue, um, the blue filter I was using for that. That's why the red spot's not standing out, but it's right there is where it is. But look at the detail in that compared to the other one. And that's because Jupiter was placed high in the sky and the seeing conditions, in other words, um, the, the turbulence was very, very low that night. It's still there, but considerably lower than what it was here. So there's two things that were going against me on the first one was the fact that it's so low. And the second one was the fact that it's, uh, there was the seat, what they call seeing conditions weren't great. Let me show you again the same picture that we I showed you earlier tonight. Here's the video from Mars, the image that we saw that I took and you, uh, Chris put up earlier. So that's kind of what I was looking at. It was just coming up, so it's still low on the horizon, and I couldn't get it up to where I wanted to because the clouds came in as the astronomer's worst thing. <laughs> you spend all the time prepping, you're excited, and then the clouds. But in any event, that's what the video would look like. And uh, from there, all you're going to do is basically um, you're going to stack that in software. It's going to create one image. You're going to put it in some software and uh, make it look nice and pretty. And that's basically that. Now, let me just find my way back home here. I think I'm here. There I am. I'm going to stop presenting. There, I'm back. So that's a, that's a, a very, very compact um, version of what to when you're if you're going to get into serious planetary or moon lunar imaging if you want to get the right camera and you've already got the telescope you know your focal length do a little math on it but look for those smaller chips if you can get it because planetary cameras are nowhere near as expensive as buying deep sky astrophotography cameras that are cooled and big chips and all that so if you, planetary and lunar imaging is still very affordable to get into if you've already got a telescope and uh, and a diagonal where you can stick an eyepiece in your planetary camera just pops in exactly the same place or you can take your diagonal out and slide it right into the telescope but um planetary cameras you can buy three four hundred dollars will buy a decent planetary camera all the software to run that camera is free it either comes with the camera or you can download uh some free so uh, capture software and uh and as far as processing is concerned all the stacking software is free, um, and usually you've got something on your computer to manipulate a picture, and that's really all you need. So planetary imaging, lunar imaging is very affordable to get into. It's a whole lot of fun, and it's a great way to practice all of your stuff. You're muted. Can you... you <laughs> hey, um, um, and uh, and uh, uh, I can. Uh, <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> is there a chart or a guide on how large a resolution should be based on how large an image is that you want to print? Okay, read that to me again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here, I'll read it to you again when I'm muted. <laughs> uh, Paul asks, is there a chart or guide on how large your resolution should be based on how large an image is that you want to print? Well, I'm not sure um, that either. Uh, I, well, printing a picture is a, is, a, is a different game than selecting and doing what we're talking about. Because when you're done with your photograph um, in your software, you can save uh, certain resolution sizes. You can choose if you want it to be large uh, with a certain resolution. You can, uh, you know, within reason. Most people like to, sh you know, if you're going to print something, you know, maybe 20 inches by 
say 20 by 20 for something like that. That's still not considered a large resolution picture. But if you're shooting um, with um, uh, a camera that's shooting at, you know, say 2000 by 1500, you could, you know, you can fill half a wall with something of that size. Even some um, medium sized JPEGs, providing that the picture is taking well, taken well, you, you can certainly uh, get some fantastic results. Um, but you have, when you're, when you're uh, saving your picture, that's when you're going to choose the, um, the image size and, uh, and the image, um, uh, oh, there's a word I can, just a second, I'll tell you in a second. My brain is uh, on hold because I've been doing so many pictures. So there's uh, image size and canvas size. So the image size is the, actually the resolution that you're gonna choose. And then the canvas size is either gonna meet that or you can expand it. But if, you're, if your canvas size is larger, then your image size, then you're going to run into, you're going to have to put borders on. So um, anyway, just stuff like that. But that's a printing thing, which is a whole different thing. But so long as you're shooting in relatively high resolution, and what I mean by that is <clears throat> that picture of Mars that I showed you was from a camera that can only go 640 uh, lines of resolution. That's that's not extremely high, but because of the size of the image scale, um, it still gives up all kinds of work with. So. Okay, gotcha. I hope that answers the question. I think that does, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. Okay, I guess while well, we're into, uh, where are we at now? We're at we are an at hour and 16 minutes. Yeah, I, we're I think we're. I think we're good. I think we're going to call that an evening. Unless there's anything else you guys want to add for this evening? Next week, we're going to do another talk on, oh, well, a gearbox segment will now be part of our regular segments, so we'll bring that in. Um, on the 17th, I believe it is, Chris Swedick from... Uh, Rask NB is going to join us on a talk on light pollution. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, down the road we have some other guests coming in too, so we're going to keep them a secret for the moment so we can get you to tune in to make sure that you know who they are. Bring you, bring you back. Teach you to bring you back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I, can I mention something too? Sure, about, please. Uh, the new gearbox statement? Yeah. The gearbox statement is just stuff that – it's just like a, uh, we can do reviews on stuff. We can show you how to use stuff. Uh, it's all about the equipment that's out there that uh, you know that's, that you want to know about. So if there's a piece of gear that you want reviewed, if we have it, if we don't have it, we'll, we'll look it up. If there's something um, that you want to know about, uh, what should what should does this go with this? These questions are what the gearbox is really all about. So it's to educate you in the products that are out there to help you get, uh, you know, get to get to where you want to go uh, with Absolutely. astronomy. So. Absolutely, Paul. That's very true. Great. We're looking forward to that segment now as a regular segment. What's that? It will get better with time. It will. It always does. <laughs> I know. It was great. Yeah. What was Paul going to call us? A turkey neck? Uh, Astronomy show? <laughs> we're, all, we're all getting to the age now. We're getting, yeah. Down little, here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Another good, another good night. So uh, in closing tonight, folks, we want to thank you again for your continued support. Um, thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her uh, continued contribution to the show. Remember, too, we do love getting your photos in here. So please send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. All one long name, but it all counts. And we'll be happy to include them in our next broadcast. We're also looking for suggestions, like Paul mentioned, for topics for future shows as well. So if you have anything that you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, uh, please send your request to the same address, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to make it happen for you. We also ask that if you enjoyed, this, uh, enjoyed the content here and you joined us from YouTube and you haven't quite uh, subscribed to our site yet, please do consider subscribing to our channel. And please let your family and friends know that we are here every Sunday night at the same time to educate you and entertain you and uh, sometimes well yeah we try to get along with that <laughs> on the night sky and other things so for now then uh, folks from paul mike and i uh, please stay safe everybody out there we wish you all clear skies and we hope to see you back here again next week and as we'd like to say here guys keep your scopes point it up have a great night folks and have a great week <laughs>